I was only 18 years old, and I was having dinner with my new girlfriend's parents for the first time. I was desperately trying to make a good impression when the conversation took a turn. I wasn't prepared for. They had met Steve and Claire Phillips three days earlier at one of our summer picnics and wanted to know more about them. Steve and Kelly were nice people and I really liked them. I even had a little secret. I was best man at their wedding. How that wedding came about as a whole. Other story. In the neighborhood where I grew up, there were Saturday night dances in the summer. Sometimes there was live music, but on the best nights we would spin records. Oh my God, some of those bands weren't very good. I was 17 at the time. It was the first Saturday night dance of the summer, and I was standing next to Steve Phillips. Steve was about 35 years old and married to Jean. She was like Marilyn Monroe with the morals of a street cat. Forget it. I shouldn't insult street cats like that. Jean had a serious medical condition. She couldn't keep her knees together when an adult male was around her. Money, an expensive suit, and a fancy car only seemed to add to her deplorable condition. John must have married Steve for security and his income. She certainly didn't love him, considering the pain she regularly inflicted on him. I was only 17, but even at that age, we all know that married women shouldn't date. In fact, I could never venture to call her behavior dating when I talked to my girlfriend's parents since I was dating their daughter and didn't want Jean's behavior to affect my business in any way, you know the old, how do you boil a frog story? So it apparently started slowly with little things and then gradually gained momentum until Steve turned out to be an irredeemable cuckoo. I never understood how or why he put up with it. It ended at the first summer Saturday night dance when she brought her bowo to it. He turned out to be a smarmy creep. He didn't know anyone there but Jean and no one knew him, but he acted like he owned the place. We all looked at Steve, who was standing against the wall watching his wife dance with her bowao. It was a very family-oriented congregation, so there were some things you just couldn't do. Obviously, going out with some jerk in front of his wife was not acceptable, but putting his hand down and stroking her ass was definitely not something the neighbors wanted to do. Every time he did that, Jean let out a slight squeal and snuggled even closer to him. When the neighbors had had enough, several wives approached the loving couple and told them to leave. The freak protested, but then the husbands came over and settled the matter. As they left the dance hall, the creep looked back at Steve and smirked. He obviously knew who Steve was. Then his loving wife leaned toward Steve and smiling broadly kissed him. They both laughed as they walked out of the house. As I stood next to Steve watching his wife and her companion walk across the porch of the dance hall, the creep lowered his hand again to stroke Jean's ass. She let out another little squeal and moved closer to him. I don't know what came over me. I was just a smart boy and he was a grown married man. But I looked at Steve and said, Do you put up with this? He looked at me with a crushed expression on his face and said, Look at me. Jake, how else am I going to get a woman like Jean? I had answers to that question. I wanted to say you could rent her by the hour or there are several streets in town where you could find one. But she was still his wife, good or bad, and I needed to show some respect for him, if not for her. Finally, I looked at him and said, When are you going to stop trying to impress other guys and find the one that makes you happy? Like I said, I was just a smart kid. Surprisingly, he didn't hit me. Instead, he just stood there looking at me with glassy eyes until he started nodding his head. I apologized for my words and tried not to think about it again. Two weeks later, Steve made his unfaithful wife file divorce papers at work. He figured that at least some of her companions worked there too, so it was appropriate. Apparently, he'd had enough. That evening when Jean came home, the neighbors were treated to a real show. They only heard part of it since she was the only one yelling, but it was still worth the price of admission. I found out about it the next day in our neighborhood news travels fast. The best line of the evening was Stephen Phillips. Either you stop this divorce nonsense right now, or I'm going to leave you and you'll never see me again. I thought that was the most appropriate definition of an empty threat and laughed about it for days. Steve had made his decision but he was not a happy man. Gene soon moved out, but he continued to go about his business as a man in a daze. However, his life was soon to change, needing to jump into the last dance of the season. Steve was hardly seen that summer, and we assumed he had locked himself away in his house. We were wrong. The orchestra was playing, couples were dancing, and then Steve walked in with someone in his arms who wasn't Gene. You know how in the movies, when the action stops, the room gets quiet, and you can only hear the crickets chirping outside the window. Even the orchestra sensed something was wrong and stopped playing. All eyes turned to Claire, 
a pretty, albeit somewhat thin, middle-aged woman who was being held by the arm of an accountant who had suffered for years from his wife's infidelity. Claire was taken aback for a moment. She even took a step back, concerned that all eyes were on her. I don't know who started clapping first. But within a minute, everyone in the room was applauding the appearance of this unassuming and somewhat shy couple who entered the dance hall with the idea that they would dance a couple of times and Steve would introduce Claire to the neighbors. But that's not how it went down. Several people standing closest to the door approached the couple and began to introduce themselves. Moments later, several wives singled Claire out from the herd, and she found herself surrounded by smiling wives with questions. She seemed to enjoy the attention. Claire danced every other dance with Steve that night, but in between, each husband took her to welcome her to the dance floor. No one had time to dance with Claire more than halfway through the dance before someone cut in, but no one complained. The wives didn't let Steve get bored on the dance floor either, and the happy couple went home with that warm feeling that only comes from acceptance and good friends. A few months later on a sunny afternoon in early winter, I met Steve on the street and casually asked him how he and Claire ended up together. This is how he told the story. I didn't add or take anything away. I'm still a little surprised by what he told me, but then he had something to ask me too. That Thursday in the middle of the morning after Friday, when Steve handed Jean the divorce papers, his secretary, with whom he had lived with for seven years, walked into his office and closed the door behind her. So boss, what's going on all week? You've been ignoring everyone and this isn't like you. What did that bitch do now? Not this time. I'm the one who did something. I filed for divorce, he said. Claire let out a yelp, jumped up and slammed her fist into the air. It's about damn time. Steve, you can do so much better than she can. God. Steve, I thought this day would never come. You should celebrate funny. I don't feel much like celebrating, he said. I mean, I couldn't live like this anymore. It had to end. Still, I feel like a part of me died and that part of me is lost forever. Steve, trust me, this is just the beginning of a much better life. She hesitated, then uncharacteristically leaned over and kissed his cheek, smiling. She turned and left the room, but not without taking. One last look back at Steve Friday morning brought Steve the first of two big surprises. Claire walked into his office and said, Boss, you're coming to my house for a home yuk dinner tonight. How do you like your tenderloin potatoes and asparagus with holland sauce? Steve appreciated the gesture but said, Thanks really, I don't think I'd be good company. Did that sound like a request to you? Claire looked him over, smiled briefly and said, You're joining us for a home yuk dinner tonight. Be there at seven and don't be late. What was he to do another night alone would be no better than the last five. Besides, he had to please Claire or his life at the office would be no better than at home. At 7 p.m., he stood at her door with a bottle of wine in his left hand and his right hand on the bell. The door opened. Claire peeked out from behind the door, smiled, and invited him in. He was still in a daze after handing Jen the papers and was almost unaware of what was going on around him. He heard the door close and turned to say, I really don't think I'll be good company tonight, but the words never came out. Steve was telling me the story and looked me in the eye when he said. I turned around to look at her, and she was wearing red high-heeled shoes. Yeah, I thought about it for a moment and said that sounds nice. I guess the color red means she was having fun. No, you don't understand. He said all she was wearing was a pair of red high-heeled shoes. He smiled in a way I'd never seen him smile before for a moment. I remembered your words to me that night at the dance and thought that woman could make me happy to tell the truth. She has always made me happy. I just didn't realize until that moment how much she had become a part of my life. Now I really didn't know what to say. After much thought, the only thing I could come up with was so, how was dinner good? By this time I was smiling. We didn't eat until almost midnight, but it was great now. I was at a loss for words and really didn't know what to say back to him. Jean's treatment of him had kept me awake for a long time. I had nightmares several times in which I woke up to the fact that I was married to a wife as unfaithful as Jean. I was beginning to think that maybe now those nightmares would leave me. Jake, I have a favor to ask of you. Claire and I are getting married in about five months, and I would like you to be my best man. This was something I didn't expect. I told him I was touched but asked him if he had a closer friend he'd rather have. He said I was there for him during his divorce, and he wants me to be there for him during the wedding as well. How can you say no to a request like that? I agreed and said I would do my best, but I didn't know how that promise would turn out. I won't even try to tell you about the bachelor party I threw when I wasn't old enough to buy alcohol. 
that's a whole other story. The wedding day came and I was standing with the groom a little ways down the aisle when the bridesmaid of honor tapped me on the shoulder. The bride would like to speak to the best man I looked at Steve. He shrugged, and I stepped back to talk to the bride. I had heard stories about brides on their wedding day, and the walk to the back of the church felt more like the last mile. I was led into the bride's dressing room and was immediately surrounded by the entire wedding party. I felt trapped. Claire looked beautiful. She smiled at me and started by asking, How is the groom holding up? It was an easy question. I replied, He's perfectly fine and looking forward to the wedding. The bridesmaids laughed a little. I figured I was doing just fine. The bride then asked, Do you know the duties of a best man? I answered. I replied, I have three duties, not losing the ring, giving a good toast, and not embarrassing the bride. All the bridesmaids laughed a little louder. I was on a roll. The bride was smiling. No, she said. I mean, do you know the traditional role of best man? I didn't know I didn't have a clue. I was stumped, she said. If for some reason the groom cannot officiate the wedding, it is up to the best man to marry the bride. This caused the newlyweds to laugh uncontrollably. They enjoyed this little performance at my expense. The bride was smiling yet looking at me and not taking her eyes off me. I knew it was her day and I had to proceed with caution, but I also knew I couldn't let her go unpunished. After a moment, I said, I'm told you look great in red shoes. At those words, all the bridesmaids shrieked and screamed with laughter. The bride's eyes widened and she hid her face in her palms between her fingers. She could see that she was blushing every shade of red, and it was obvious that the whole bridal party knew the story. After a while, she raised her head and said with a smile, Yes, yes, I know, this caused another explosion of laughter from the newlyweds. Finally, she said, Tell the groom... I'll be there soon, and I happily departed. When I got back to Steve, he asked what was that I just shrugged and replied. Shoes? He must have been more nervous than I thought because he just nodded as if it was the most natural thing to do, and we went back to silently waiting for the bride to come out. A few minutes later, the bride walked down the aisle to smiles and tears on both sides as she stood in front of the altar with her hands interlocked with her grooms. She leaned back and behind his back, she smiled at me and kissed me. Now it was my turn to blush and I turned all shades of red, and then I remembered the third duty of the best man. The bride always has the last word, 